Uh, a couple of corrections uh, to the introduction is, uh, number one, I was born in Mobile, Alabama, <laughs> <laughs> and, and fell in love with Maine. <laughs> and uh, the, the second one is that uh, uh, a lot of my research started at IBM uh, on the, both the financial markets and Saturn, Saturn 1B. Uh, so, I'm used to running teams of large programmers, you know, uh, 200 people that have to convert one language to another to w run on a small computer on an on onboard rocket. So, I learned a lot about uh, forecasting software development, forecasting projects, and found out that it was almost impossible to get it right. So, this project here, over yonder key, is... Uh, started out as, I wonder if we could take an island, a 72-acre island, and make it its own microgrid and create enough energy to run the island and a little extra to sell to our neighbors. So that was the idea. So we named that Over Yonder Key. And last year, we spoke here on Over Yonder Key and its development. And this year, uh, the microgrid concept for the island has become so successful that many people are trying to emulate this. Now, we started six years ago, so we had a, a lot of bumpy, had a lot of long bumpy road to get through to figure this out. Now, there are a lot of companies following us trying to do it. NRG is right up there. Uh, they took Richard Branson's island uh, in the uh, British Virgin Islands, Necker Key, and they took that island and said, we're going to put a megawatt of solar on it. So <coughs> we were invited by Richard Branson to speak in the Caribbean. I told Graham about it and thought maybe they might be interested in coming down. And it was called the Carbon War Room. And uh, they formed the Carbon War Room a number of years ago to deal with the uh, carbon emission problem on planet Earth and the percentage of uh, carbon that's emitted into the uh, atmosphere that's creating uh, the problems that we know uh, of w global warming. There must be some percentage of that coming from that. And certainly if you've been to Beijing lately and you see everybody wearing a mask, it's out of control with the coal-fired plants over there. So the, the whole idea of taking an island and trying to make it green was a little easier where we did it. But we did it in the Caribbean. It has two advantages. Every island in the Caribbean uh, has, is in the trade wind belt. So the average wind throughout the winter months is probably 15 to 22 knots. And with the Bahamas having a few cold fronts thrown in, we're in really good shape in the Bahamas. So that's number one. And number two, most of the islands in the Caribbean are tax havens. So that is, there's a 50% duty, and that's the way they raise their money, that they run their government. So there's no, for example, Bahamas. There's no income tax, there's no estate tax, there's no income tax, there's no capital gain tax, there's no inheritance tax, dot, dot, dot. So how do you run a country when you don't have all that? Well, Europeans uh, figured it out with VAT taxes, but the VAT taxes tend to penalize the poor, inordinately so. So what's happened in, in the Bahamas is that between no natural resources and a 50% tax on diesel fuel, it creates an entire string of poverty through every one of those islands because you cannot keep up with the price of fossil fuel and you have nothing to export. So it's, it's a real shame of the financial structure of the governments of most of those islands, but it does represent an opportunity. And the opportunity is that whole trade wind belt is the, is the best place in the world to go after uh, green energy. Why? You've got the trade winds and you've got sunshine beyond belief in the Bahamas, sunshine beyond belief. So when we first got into green energy six or seven years ago, 
I thought, well, that's a shame about Maine because we're building a house on Southport and uh, we want to do this project at the Botanical Gardens and it's a quite a shame about the sunshine. Then I realized that the difference in Nassau and Booth Bay in terms of the amount of sunshine you get over the 12 month period is, is minimal, it's not, not a big part of the problem. So I would think it would be 50, 60% different. Phoenix, Arizona versus Booth Bay, not the case. Just have to angle the, the uh, actual PV arrays in a different way. Now, wind's a different matter. Uh, wind's great in the center of the Gulf of Maine, but it's uh, spotty along the coast. So this talk tonight is really about what happened as a result of us building the island and what kind of energy transition we're in. So this is really an uh, introduction to energy transition. So an energy transition is like when everybody on the planet burned wood and they found out that coal was better. It was a transition from wood to coal. And then in 1900, everybody was using coal and then along came oil and the transition from to fossil fuels, uh, natural gas and oil took a long time. And the transition from wood to coal took a long time, hundreds of years. And the transition is about complete now from coal to oil, not naturally because of the governments have decided, uh, the US government in particular decided that it's too dirty and uh, we're gonna penalize these uh, evil coal companies and they're trying, and so we're, they're all getting put out of business in favor of cheaper and better natural gas. So the, the, the concept of energy transition is what I want to talk about. What this, and I'll take you through some of the transition just to give you a picture and tell you how over over yonder Keith fits into the, the global picture. <coughs> so this is interesting in the following following way that in 1900 American farmers needed three minutes of labor to produce one kilogram of wheat. Uh, in the year 2000, one second fossil fuel, diesel fuel, and the combines. So that's part of the concept of an energy transition that we want to talk about. Now, the population of the Earth is forecast in 2024 to be 8 billion people and 9 billion in 2048. So we're starting to flatten out <coughs> for a variety of reasons. We're starting to run low on water across the planet. We're starting to uh, have problems getting enough food, et cetera, et cetera. So this energy transition is the, the, the focal point of this talk about how do we move now from the fossil fuel world into the renewable world and how do we harness that and what should the transition look like and what could over yonder key be in terms of a role model for the Caribbean, and if it works there, it's going to work across the continent of Africa and across India, where there's not enough copper left to run wires to wire those two planets. So you have to build microgrids. And so the concept today that all the energy companies, NRG in particular, is we want to get into the microgrid business. That's a huge business already with telecom sites. Whenever you talk on a cell phone in out of the way place in Sonora, Mexico, there's a cell tower running on a diesel generator sitting out there that, uh, and there's something like uh, uh, 400,000 of these telecom sites spread around the globe. And they represent a little tiny microgrid. So over yonder key represents a microgrid. Um, so this energy transition the global energy consumption through 2008. As you can see, hydro uh, is limited geographically in just a number of rivers that you can use. Nuclear is unlimited and by far the most favorable source, but every time there's a Chernobyl or a Fukushima, the reaction is, Andrea Merkel says, well, uh, we're gonna shut down eight and get rid of the rest of these. And uh, 
So that, that turned into a huge uh, prejudice against uh, nuclear. Even if it could be done in a way to earthquake proof them, et cetera, uh, the, the, pre the, the population has been pretty well brainwashed into thinking that nuclear is bad. So if you look at this, natural gas seems to be the winner. And the nice thing about living in the United States is we have enough natural gas to last 300 years, if you believe the reservoir engineering models. But unfortunately, most of it's lo locked into shale, which means that you spend a lot of money drilling the well and making uh, a bunch of uh, horizontal holes that go out from the bottom called, you know, parallel into the reservoir, and then fracking them. And uh, very interesting because the fracking starts getting a bad name. So, sort of like fracking is now like uh, nuclear. Oh, it's evil. It's going to release this gas. It's going to come up in my bathtub one night, and I'm going to die. So I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff that's out there on fracking, which is most of it is nonsense. But this is where we are right now. Crude oil and coal or neck and neck, but coal is starting to fall dramatically right now because of the EPA. So I live in a state part of the year in Texas, so there's no state income tax. And uh, fastest job growth in the country, and a lot of oil is produced there, and there would be a lot more things produced except for the EPA. So I think the Attorney General of Texas has 25 lawsuits against the EPA just from operation, their operations in Texas. So it, Texas is one of those states that, you know, that you look at the problem, you solve it, and uh, the influx from people from California into Texas is massive now. California is very over-regulated, Texas is not. Now, when we uh, first built our house here in Maine, I realized how overregulated Maine was <laughs> with the way in which the decisions are made about what kind of house you can build and whether you can have curtains up and what color the curtains. And th then I realized that the regulation had gone too far here, so uh, I've campaigned quite a bit in that area with uh, Mr. LePage to try to move, move the state in the right direction. So we're making progress there. <coughs> now, this is the world energy consumption of oil, coal, gas, hydro, nuclear. Now, look at the green down there. Look at the green. Hydro's green, but the other renewables, you see the small penetration of the use of energy from renewables? So we have a long ways to go. That green, uh, people have forecast this before. Rocky Mountain Institute, I'll show you one of their forecasts. This is, this is a very interesting uh, thing that comes out every year from the Lawrence Livermore Radiation Laboratory, where this is where our energy is coming from and where it's going to produce electricity and so forth. Now, the interesting thing about this is that petroleum is used mostly in transportation. Diesel fuel for trucks and um, Gasoline for cars, and even certain states, natural gas for cars. But the transportation industry dominates down there. One of the problems with it is that it's the least efficient use of energy there is. 80% of the energy is lost to heat. 20% of it, you run your car and you're flying your jet. The rest of it is lost to heat. So it's very inefficient. If you look over on the right-hand side, you can see how much energy is lost in the process. So one of the things we have to look at in designing anything is wh what are the heat, what are the losses, and how efficient is my process? So Rocky Mountain Institute made these predictions in 1976, where renewables would be. And where renewables are is 7%, actual consumption. What that, what, one of the reasons I'm showing you that slide is that it's telling you how difficult it is to get rid of one energy and move to another one that's better, in, in better for the planet, better for the environment, 
uh, but it has its own set of problems. We're going to talk about that a little bit. There are two countries that have done well with the wind energy and solar, and that's uh, Germany. And uh, of course, France is 95% nuclear, and they sell their nuclear to Andrea Merkel in Germany because she didn't want those, plant, uh, those nuclear plants in her country. <laughs> But the problem is forecasting renewable penetration has been wrong every year. That w forecast in 76, 30 to 50 percent. Where are we 24 years later? We're at 7 percent. So this is a brief history of the energy, uh, what we call the energy transitions. Uh, we started out wood to charcoal to coal from 1800 to 1900. And then the next transition was coal to oil, 1900 to 2000. The interesting thing is, from coal to oil, uh, it took 50 years for it to get 10% penetration. 30 more years to go from 10 to 25%. So these forecasts about how quickly renewable energy is going to penetrate our planet have been way off because these transitions occur slowly. The good news is natural gas is uh, everybody's favorite right now, and we have a lot of it. It just costs a lot to extract under current conditions where politics are heavily involved in fracking. Now, why the Caribbean? Why is that so interesting? I told you the two main reasons. The trade wind belt, created by the world uh, weather patterns. Uh, and the other one is the tax structure of those countries, which causes diesel fuel to cost 55, 60% more than it does in Booth Bay. So here, the average retail, average cost on your utility bill in the Caribbean is 33 cents. Now let's compare that with Texas. Texas went nuclear 35 years ago with a South Texas nuclear plant, which lights up Houston, Dallas, San Antonio. The production cost a day per kilowatt hour at that old plant sitting on uh, Palacios Bay along the coast of Texas is a penny and a half. So it's a vast difference when people start talking about 33 cents or it's a penny and a half. Now, they manage to mark it up and sell it to various power companies and so forth, so we'd maybe pay eight cents in, in Texas, nine cents. <coughs> the nice thing about this wind speed is that the whole Caribbean is mineable for wind. And over yonder key, we found a survey by NOAA. National Oceanographic Administration, they, that said the island had 15 knots 12 months out of the year. They were wrong. We were wrong. We, we, we built everything and did what we were supposed to. It turns out it was 16 and a half knots since we've been there. So we're very happy about that. So the whole Caribbean's like that. 16 and a half knots. And at the Carbon Conference, the, called the Carbon War Room in the British Virgin Islands with Richard Branson, we were invited to give a keynote speech of how do you do this? How do you turn an island green? And Richard was very interested in doing his, and he invited NRG to give the other talk. And they, they kept talking about solar. Now, there must be some mathematicians, physicists, scientists in the audience. Okay, solar, you put up an array under the sun, and uh, 10 years ago, eight years ago, six years ago, maybe you'd get 10% of that harvested through the PV panel. And recently, breakthroughs are up to 22%. But it's linear. Every breakthrough is linear. Wind makes power in proportion to the cube of the wind speed. So which one would you pick first? So you're not going to go linear when you could go cubic. That's a utility bill from uh, somebody uh, in uh, the Bahamas and uh, earning, you know, two or three hundred dollars a month. 
So you see the problem, if you don't have any exports, you don't have a, a big economy, you know, energy dominates everything in your life, all your decisions. Now here's the island of Barbados. This is a very interesting island. It sits way out in the Lesser Antilles toward Africa, not in line with all the other islands, very seldom visited except by airplane, <laughs> because way out there, and it's a weather beat for people who sail, and so you tend to skip it, and uh, the plane, plane arrives from London, and everyone vacations there, I and mean, here's their situation. They decided to go green, and um, the interesting thing about that is that if they put up 500 kilowatts, um, <coughs> if they put up 1.5 megawatt turbine and versus PV, you see the difference. The green at the bottom is because you cube the wind speed. And the, the blue is because it's linear with solar. It's a, it's a mathematician talking here, how that works. So that's an example of an island that it's got a ferocious wind speed all year. It's a very easy island to turn completely green. As a matter of fact, at the conference with Richard Branson, what we gave was a model for the entire Caribbean. Now, here's another interesting thing. Most of the islands in the Caribbean don't have fresh water. None of the Bahamas have fresh water. Why? Geologically, they represent a giant limestone plug that came up and stuck up in, into the sea, into the ocean, and it, it's all shallow water on top of that plug. And no matter how, drill, how deep you drill in that plug, you get the salinity down 100 feet, 300 feet, 1,000 feet, the same as it is the surface. The limestone is very permeable. So what we decided to do was to try if you can't make the island 100% green, maybe what you could do is build a water business. Uh, one revolution of one of these uh, Vermont-built northern, uh, <coughs> northern power turbines produces a liter of water. So if I don't use it to run my hair dryer and I just want to run a water maker, I can get actually one liter of water. Now, what does that mean? That was with the efficiency of five years ago, uh, we, could, uh, we could build a business out of this. So water in the Caribbean, uh, what you do is when you overproduce, when you, when you get extra wind, which you get a lot of, and extra solar, which you get a lot of, you run extra water makers and store the water until you have a million gallons or two million, whatever you need filled, and then you start bottling it and selling it because the biggest import to the Bahamas by far is bottled water. And look at the cost, 60 cents a liter. So we decided that that would be a good way instead of selling power to your neighbors is take the extra power and build a water business because everybody needs the water, and we were going to call it Bahamas Wind Water. So in five months of wind production in 2013, um, we had 10 to 12% curtailment because it was too much power, too much wind. And uh, you're talking about 136,800 diesel costs saved. And what, what are the problems, what is the main problem that's preventing the growth of renewable energy when you're on a microgrid? Well, the main problem is you can't store it. Batteries are horrendously expensive. This is a battery room on over yonder key with glass mat batteries, the highest that you can buy today, most efficient. In that room, by far, is the most expensive thing on the island. That's a $5 million room for batteries. So no one solved the problem of storing renewable energy cheaply. And renewable energy comes at you when the sun shines 
and during the day, and it comes at you when the wind blows, and it's more than you need most of the time, but you have nowhere to store it. You fill the batteries up and have three day supply to cost you to sell, sell have three more days, cost you another five million. So you can't store it in batteries. So somebody's got to solve that problem. That's a very interesting scientific problem. A lot of people are working on it. We'll talk about that. So the, there are three turbines on the, on the island, and the, what happens in hurricanes, both of the, uh, all the towers are insured to 150 knots, but at 75 knots, the uh, turbines, uh, the blades freeze, and uh, we've been through uh, two hurricanes already. Uh, Irene and the one that came up this way, Sandy. So, uh, the nice thing about the Exuma chain where we are is you don't get hurricanes crossing it because the offshore, maybe a mile offshore, it's two and a half miles deep. And so, hurricanes need deep water to sustain their spin cycle and their, their giant heat pumps. And they, they use that heat of the ocean. So if you put half a hurricane over land and half the hurricane in, 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 in deep water, the hurricane has a tendency to go back to deep water because it's a living organism, so to speak, that's going to try to propagate itself. The solar field is 382 kilowatts, and since we've installed that, they've, in, they've made solar 100% uh, more efficient than it was, and we're going to put these solars in in the next six months. We were going to go tidal. We have the current, we have the engineering, we have the tidal generators to do it, but the regulatory environment is not favorable. Uh, we're in a deep water cut, which is the main channel coming in there, and uh, we know that uh, one of those tidal things is going to get run over by a boat or something. And uh, we felt like doubling the solar would be easier. Now, in case both of them are down, your batteries are empty, here's standby. Three 250 kilowatt caterpillars. This is, an, this is an integral part of it, bi-directional inverters. Remember, solar array uh, produce uh, DC electricity and they've got to be converted, and windmills produce AC electricity, and all that has to go into a, a room and a software system and generally a system that takes it all and turns it into usable power to run your hair dryer in every one of the villas on the island. So the good news is there's a company in Austin, Texas uh, that, that replaced all this junk here by this, a flywheel. So why hadn't somebody thought about that before? If you ever got on a locomotive in the 1920s, you ever got on any kind of vehicle, they always had a flywheel turning to store the energy bumps. And uh, this company called Active Power, Austin, Texas, is a new hot tech startup, and their idea was to uh, basically put two flywheels on over yonder key and they agreed to give them to us, to donate them to us because they think the project is so fantastic there will be such great advertising for them. So they're putting two flywheels on the island and these flywheels will smooth out the bumps that exist in renewable energy. One of the problems with renewable energy, wind, gust, you got to take the gust, the good with the bad, and sun goes behind a cloud for 12 minutes, three minutes, two hours, you gotta take that. And that's what the flywheel does. It takes and stores that DC and AC energy in a spinning big chunk of metal, the flywheel, and it makes it usable to you, and it replaces this giant piece of equipment here. So it's a great idea, great startup, publicly traded company. Uh, they liked this deal so much, they even gave us some of the stock. 
So active power. This is the reverse osmosis plant. We're storing 500,000 gallons in a cistern. And the RO efficiency has gone up dramatically. Uh, the next thing that you need to do is you need to have an information technology infrastructure on the island to deal with all this. So this is what we have. We have dedicated on-island servers, high-speed fiber backbone across the island, power meters at every place on the island where you use any electricity. And we have an on-island weather station on a tower, and we predict the wind for the next week, and we predict the solar movement and the cloud movement. The latest thing is there's a, a PhD that showed up and said, I've got a great predictive model of when the sun's going to get covered by the clouds, and it solves all the partial differential equation model of weather flow on, on a microgrid basis in just your area. So that's what we're putting in to further increase the efficiency of the model. So there's a picture of over yonder key in operation. And that day, the wind was 75%. Solar was 25%. That's the cut up at the top of the island, which we were going to do tidal. And instead, we're going to go to increase efficiency of solar and one other thing that we're going to add. So this is the electrical production at that moment in time. So this is a real-time piece of software that we developed, struggled and struggled to get it right. And that's what NRG says they're going to do. But this is, a, this is an entrepreneurial game. They're big companies. So I'm not sure how quickly they're going to get there. Uh, this, is <coughs> this is the system is called uh, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. So that's a giant piece of software that needs to be uh, controlling everything that's going on, on the island, including your water production. So up at the top right, you see the production and the demand. And uh, this balances that. And it needs a weather forecasting uh, system involved. So it's a, it's a complicated piece of software to run a microgrid. But the interesting thing is once you've solved this problem for a microgrid, you can plunk it down in, in, in sub-Sahara Africa. And it should work as long as you've got good weather forecasting for wind and, and solar. So the blue is the amount of gallons that we're using in each of the villas. And this is a typical turbine day wind tower. So if I look at wind tower, one, two, three, and add them all up, uh, that's how much we're getting from wind. And the colors there represent this week, last week, et cetera. Uh, this is a power curve on the total wind. And everything below that line going up is where we had to curtail because we had nowhere to store it. So we waste maybe 20% of the energy that comes from wind and solar because the batteries are full, the water makers have filled every cistern on the island, and there's nowhere to put it. So no one's come up with the solution. Uh, what we call renewable energy storage. Now, why isn't that a problem in the United States when I have wind, when I have solar? Because I sell it into the grid. In Maine, we built a house on Southport. We made it solar, and we give it back to Central Maine Power for nine months, and then we have a bank account, and we use that bank account in the summer of power. So you can calculate the amount of solar you need, and you can zero out your balance with central main power. So we took that a step further when we uh, supported the build of the center, the lead center at the Botanical Garden. And uh, that's a total, totally green platinum rated uh, building. And uh, they produce enough solar to, do, to run it. And so the good, good news is it can be done here in Maine with solar if you could get uh, the planning boards to let you take some tops out of some pine trees. <laughs> but so you have to pick your evil. 
So this represents the diurnal cycle uh, of, of solar. So you get it during the day, and uh, that's it. So you have to design everything to store that. So this is uh, Villa One uh, on the island. And there's an example of today's power in blue and yesterday's power in red. And the water demand, 6.7 gallons per minute. So all of this is uh, running a giant data bank and a giant control system. is all now fully automated. And as soon as we get the weather model integrated in with our energy partner, then uh, it won't take a human being to sit in front of the and run it. So there, there's the picture of the whole thing you see there. The wind, the wind dominates probably two thirds, seventy percent of the energy, and the solar is only thirty percent. So that's why I never. That's why I told Richard Branson when he was sitting with uh, the president of um, NRG, he said, m mentioned to him that when they're up there putting these million, a megawatt of solar up, and they can't get them up because the wind's blowing them over that they should have started with wind. And I just saw in the paper recently that they agreed and they're starting with uh, three towers of wind. It was just an elementary equation, you know. <laughs> the cubic, cube, cube power is very powerful. So at this point, we're 96% renewable. We probably produce 115% of the energy we need, but we lose a bunch of it because we have nowhere to store it. So the uh, the game changer for renewable energy and microgrids is somebody invents a way to store energy other than lead acid batteries, lithium ion batteries. Why not lithium ion? Um, they have the highest energy density of any battery. The problem is, is that they're heavy. So we're going to put a lithium ion, somebody offered us a lithium ion string on the island to put up, so we're going to do that. A lot of people, are, big companies are donating because this is the microgrid uh, model for the future. And it's all computer controlled now. So our partners are called Elite Energy Innovations. They're headquartered in Silicon Valley. And uh, a bunch of brilliant PhDs working in this field for a long time. And they're handling the energy innovation side. And they're putting this stuff on the island. And then we're marketing the model to anyone in the Caribbean that would like to do that. So our partner is a Caribbean um, investor who basically uh, contr uh, controls a lot of wind power throughout the Caribbean. And I think that's the direction that this, he just bought the Bahama Electric Corp so that the family islands can, can come up with a way to harvest all this wind. So he's, he's our partner down there. Now, this <coughs> Caribbean model is a good model for planet Earth as long as you've got the wind. If you've only got solar, it's very tricky because solar is 22% efficient. So there has to be something else invented, and something else was invented, and I'll talk about that in a second here. So Elite Energy Innovations, they have this, uh, uh, the key role here in managing the innovation and bringing the new ideas and things that work to the island. And that's, that's where uh, we are on over yonder key, and I want to talk about Denmark and Germany, just a little bit. This is the island of uh, Bornholm. It's a Danish island, and it has 50 knots of wind more often than not. And th this was published in IEEE Spectrum 2013. They have 41,000 full-time residents, and they're trying to make a go of it as an island that's uh, running off wind. And they've done pretty well. Uh, the design all worked, but here's some of the problems. 
On a windy day, Bornholm turbines supply 30 megawatts, more than 50% of the island's peak load. But the wind blows at will, and the, and the variability and unpredictability wrecks the grid. Remember, there's nowhere to store this stuff. When you got it, you got it. And a lot of times you don't need it, and there it is. If the wind dies, the electricity supply can dip below demand, and the grid's 50 hertz frequency of the AC plummets, and you got a blackout. So what that means for that island is, since they can't store that electricity, they can only use 15% of the wind power that comes across the island. So the problem of storage of, of, of renewable energy is the critical problem. The Europe, look at what Europe is doing. So uh, the goal of the European Commission is to get 80% renewables powering major parts of Europe. And what's happened is they've put so many windmills up in Germany and Holland and in the north coast and offshore that the entire European grid is unstable. It's also happening in Texas, which gets 10% of its power from wind. Uh, Wind comes when it wants to, and it gets put into the grid because that's the only place you can store it in the United States and Germany. There's no other way to store it, and it's created grid instability. So most of it's wasted because the storage problem has not been solved. So wind in Germany, same problem. Renewable energy is getting dumped, wasted, because the German grid cannot support the load. German wind farms dumped 127 gigawatts of energy, enough to supply 300,000 homes. So that's how bad their storage problem is. The renewable energy exists, it's there, but it comes when it wants to come. So where we are today, energy storage versus time, there's a lot of ways that are coming in the future and the biggest one is called compressed air energy storage. And then there's thermal energy storage. Compressed air energy storage is the new buzzword because you can store a lot of energy in underground, you know, in, in uh, Texas and Louisiana, they have these uh, old salt domes, which they pumped all the oil out of and all the gas out of. And so they use them to store the strategic petroleum reserve. And what we need is something like that on a microgrid basis to store renewable energy. And, and, and the thing on the horizon is compressed air energy storage, where you would do it in the ocean. So you go off over yonder key, and you go out about 500 feet of water, and you build a bubble on the bottom, and you anchor down this bubble like a dirigible, and uh, you pump air into it. Now, because you're 500 feet of water, you can pump a lot of air into it, and it's compressed by the, you know, the depth. And so that is on the horizon. It's being tested in various places. And whereas the batteries can last three days, I could store, and right offshore, right off over yonder key, I could store a month of this. And it's, so it's a good solution that occurs deep in an ocean, hurricanes don't bother it, nobody runs over it, and you just have um, the air coming back on shore and running a, a, a turbine. <coughs> now, the next phase of solar is called concentrating solar power, CSP, and it's thermally related. And this is what it is, the thermal energy storage. What you do is instead of putting a solar array up there, you uh, focus with lenses and reflectors. You focus the energy to in an intense heat, and you produce hot water. And that is the new phase that's coming up. So the solar tower steam boiler is surrounded by steered mirrors is incompatible with over yonder key, but uh, the K's, the compressed air, is compatible. So this is an example of where the microgrids can go. 
Now here's the uh, interesting thing, renewable energy penetration versus energy cost. The problem with renewable energy is where do I store it for an extended period of time? So you can't penetrate a lot without running the cost way up. So you can probably get 60% and maybe your 18 cents per kilowatt hour. Then it goes out of sight if you try to run everything green. So those are your, here are your cost for the variety uh, pieces of energy from uh, nickel cadmium batteries, uh, sodium sulfide batteries, vanadium redox batteries. That, that's the big news now is these uh, vanadium uh, flow batteries and then the Ks. Ks you can get power on the microgrid, generally speaking at 10, 10 cents per kilowatt hour, which is probably less than we pay here from Central Main Power Park. So this is where we are today. Uh, K's is coming, has a great round trip efficiency of 60 to 70 percent. And the government has got a great program called the Sunshot Initiative. It's going to reduce the cost of solar power by 75 percent uh, by 2020. It's called the solar, it, it's actually called the Sunshot, named after John F. Kennedy's moonshot. Uh, and the whole idea is to get this cost way down. But nowhere in here is a storage problem <laughs> been solved yet. So that's the state of the system. So we would like to overcome the slow energy transition paradigm. And the Caribbean is the place to prove it up, and then it can go to other continents. Africa in particular. You know, the problem with 90% of Africa is that when the sun goes down, everything is black. There are no generators, there's no diesel, there's no opportunity. So life turns off when the sun goes down. So thank you very much for coming tonight, and I've enjoyed giving you my interpretation of this uh, renewable frontier and the problems and the opportunities there.